Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 26th <coughs> meeting of the Latin America Shadow Financial Regulatory Committee. Um, my name is Liliana Rojas Suarez, Chair of the Committee and Senior Fellow here at the Center for Global Development. And with me today, I know I don't need to um, uh, present them at all to introduce them, but um, I have uh, Guillermo Calvo, currently professor from Columbia at Columbia University and with many more titles that he can remember himself. <laughs> Roque Fernandez, Fernandez, Minister of Finance, President of the Central Bank of Argentina, uh, currently the Board of Directors of SEMA, which is, um, um, maybe he can tell more about that later, but uh, is both a research and an academic institute in Argentina. Have Pablo Guidotti, also very well known by uh, most of you, um, uh, currently former dean but currently professor uh, of the School of Government of Governance at the University uh, Torcuato di Tela, again former um, deputy um, vice minister of finance as well as um, at the central bank, correct? And uh, Pedro Carvalho de Melo, uh, currently international coordinator um, for the Getulio Vargas program in Brazil, and with many other titles relating to uh, banking supervision. Um, I need to apologize for Carmen Reinhardt not being here. She couldn't make it at the last minute, um, personal reasons, and um, well, um, she sends her regards. So, the way CLAF operates is that we meet for two and a half days. Uh, in a very um, dynamic <laughs> interaction of views, and we produce a statement, and you must have a copy of it, right? Uh, well, the, they're in the back, okay? So for any of you that would like to have the statement, um, uh, yeah, okay. Oh, wow. Let's, let's wait. Uh, let's go on. Uh, Copy, yeah, no? yeah. If you want to get a copy, I will wait for one minute. It doesn't take more. Yeah, that in kilo thing, I know. Of course. <laughs> no, I'm going to I'm going to short, present short. it. It's short. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um. This time around, of course, we had to put current problems in the world at the center focus of our statement. And what I'm going to do now is to give you um, a brief presentation of what is in there. Then I'll ask my colleagues to complement what I've said, and then we'll have a discussion. The whole purpose of this is to have an interaction um, with you. So. You are all, as we are concerned, about the very volatile international financial system right now. And when you look at the numbers for Latin America, at least for the macro fundamentals, and compare them to where they were in 2007, just before the Lehman crisis, even though Latin America is still strong, the fundamentals have weakened. Just look at a couple of numbers uh, uh, posed recently by the World Economic Outlook. Um, you know, in 2007, all countries had current account surpluses. Now, most of them have current account deficits. And the same thing happens with the situation in the fiscal. Um, the data for the region was 1.3% of GDP surplus, uh, uh, fiscal surplus in 2006, uh, um, and now there is a 2.6% uh, deficit in 2011. Now, notwithstanding this weakness, but to us, it's a call of alert, of course, because if a crisis are going to hit, then, well, the, the region is weaker. But Latin America continues receiving capital inflows. And we all know, and this we have written extensively, and there is no need to go further into all the problems about the perception of temporary capital inflows. But we wanted to stress in this statement one additional component or characteristic that is being fueled by capital inflows. And it's the fact that as capital flows and goes into certain assets, it gives uh, the impression that those assets are becoming more liquid more tradable. And the perception is that once you have more liquidity, <coughs> they, of course, because of that characteristic, the price of the asset increases. 
And so, if there is going to be a bad uh, event, suddenly, well, of course, that liquidity vanishes. But you have fueled that uh, co construction of, I don't want to use the word fictitious, but temporary liquidity is something that you say, oh, look, look, look at the numbers. The assets are more liquid now, more tradable. No, they are not. They are temporary. And we wanted to add that characteristic. Um, so liquidity is an issue that concerns us and is going to dr as has driven the full statement. When I see the full statement, you know that it's only less than four pages, that full four pages. Um, because we are just going to the point, it's based on the recommendations of people that have been working on these issues, and I'm just presenting what the summary of those discussions have been. Um, so there is no need now to be talking about all the problems that might materialize if the actual uh, crisis in Europe actually takes place. But suppose that even if that crisis does not take place, and meaning a full-blown cri full, uh, crisis does not materialize, well, what is almost impossible or very hard to uh, discard is the persistence of long periods of very low uh, interest rates um, uh, in advanced economies, the risk-free interest rates, the ones that can be controlled by the authorities. But we are concerned about that. I'm not going to say we're concerned because um, that the, the problem of um, uh, uh, carry trade that goes into the exchange rate appreciation. No, that has been said many times. We have additional concerns. One of them is that it leads to an underestimation of risks. When you have low interest rates, it definitely helps banks in trouble. Right? I mean, if, if there is a, a bank, the banking system, and you can divide it in banking troubles and bank in good, in sound situation, well, low interest rates actually help the balance sheets of the banks in trouble. But at the same time, it also creates incentives for the sound banking system to take excessive risk. Now, this is not an irrational decision. It's a decision being made in the context of what the policy is being announced. So we are concerned that a prolonged period of low interest rate may actually be weakening, the f even more weakening even further, the financial system in advanced economies. So we believe, the committee believes, that um, the real solution is to go directly to the heart of the problem, deal with the toxic asset problems, with the um, um, uh, problem in the mortgage markets, as opposed to promoting low interest rates for a sustained period of time that might actually be creating or be uh, planting, as we write here, the seeds of future problems in the part of the financial system that is sound now. A second aspect in the um, world economy that is also related to this is that the very low um, risk-free interest rate distorts significantly the perceptions about public debt sustainability. You know, at very low rates, public debt looks sustainable, right? And we have a very simple example in the, in the very short note that you have with you, is that if we have interest rate of, say, 1% uh, per year for a 10-year maturity bond, even though, even though the signals are that risks are very high because the highest, there is a, a risk spread of 500 basis points, still you get a, a yield, a funding yield of about 6% per year. Well, 6% per year, many people can say, well, yes, at that yield, yeah, we can work around it and it's sustainable. But as these numbers show, just a little increase in this risk-free um, interest rate might actually make that debt that per sustainable now unsustainable. Now, think a little bit further about that. That kind of creates a trap, right? I mean, what, what can governments do? Can the central bank really increase interest rate now? Are they going to be blamed of creating of, or exacerbating the debt problem? So these are questions that we can further discuss. So the committee believes that liquidity is the essence of the problem. And Latin America needs to be alert or to the uh, possible deterioration of the external environment and build that policy defenses. But again, on the subject of liquidity, we are not going to be dealing with anything else in this statement. Okay? So we dealt with two issues. One is monetary policy, and the other one is regulatory policies. Um, on the monetary policy side, 
the first lesson that could was uh, drawn um, from the global crisis is the importance of the lender of last resort function. We know that the central banks from advanced economies use the lender of last resort function very effectively. We also know that they can do it because they are issuers of what we call and is well known as hard currency, hard currency, meaning currencies that are internationally tradable and are uh, many co commodities are denominated in those currencies. In contrast, Latin American countries cannot issue hard currency. And therefore, it would be a mirage to think that they can issue fine, um, assets that are truly safe assets for the financial system. Uh, so alternative uh, central banks recognize that. So um, the, the countries have developed alternative instruments. We all know about the accumulation of foreign exchange reserves. Um, but the committee recommends uh, that not only um, high reserves uh, is needed, but we also should focus on what happens in the local financial systems and that uh, maintaining high level of external liquidity in hard currency, both as the central bank as well as the financial system. So we're talking about the private sector financial system. So international reserves is not enough, is what we're saying. We're even saving even farther. Even that might not be enough. So what else can we get hard currency liquidity? Well, the, I, the IMF proposed and uh, put in place uh, the flexible credit line. It's a line that countries uh, can access to if they pre-qualify in terms of being, um, having a strong macro and financial fundamentals. At this stage, only two countries in Latin America have access to that line, and those are Mexico and Colombia. Um, and given that at this particular point in time, many Latin American countries pre can pre-qualify easily, we, the committee urge those countries in Latin America to actually apply for these credit lines. It's another form to actually uh, get another insurance against a, uh, a potential um, lack of hard currency liquidity in the world. A second lesson that has been learned is the importance of central bank having inflation targets. Although central banks have engaged actively, and we all know this very well in foreign exchange intervention, these operations are not explicitly announced in the monetary policy framework. When you read, and we, yesterday we went through a number of um, um, uh, statements from central banks of what, what is their objectives and all that. Um, we strongly recommend that the inflation target should be explicitly comp uh, uh, complemented by foreign exchange intervention as a policy instrument that is needed by the countries. Um, Nothing says that when you have um, exchange um, uh, inflation targeting, you're going to be free of inflation and exchange rate volatility. And so there's no contradiction at all. But countries do not explicitly recognize that, and they should, in our view, of course. Um, a different issue, however, is the recent recommendations of taking it to, uh, into account in the uh, central bank objective function, not only inflation, but also the output gap. We don't like that very much. <laughs> um, we basically think that that's assuming uh, the problems of discretionary policy, what in a, we economists call the time inconsistency problem, we think that the region have moved forward and have gotten a number of things very well done. And one of them is actually the credibility of the central bank um, inflation um, um, uh, fight for inflation, and that we shouldn't, Latin America shouldn't lose that. And, and so it could be um, dangerous to reintroduce an inflation bias given the historical um, record of the region. The third lesson is trade finance. 
You know, during the crisis, the financial transmission or, or the channel of transmission from the financial sector to the real sector was through the dry up of um, uh, uh, credit lines for trade finance. Well, during the crisis, there were mechanisms that were in place to take um, care of this problem. But to our knowledge right now, there is nothing there in the international community, in the multilateral organizations, that actually make sure that trade finance is not cut. So we uh, recommend and, uh, that the international community, and this is not so much for the IMF, we're thinking more the IFC, perhaps, um, should put in place instruments for the private sector, possibly taking some, in this instrument could take some of the characteristic of automaticity uh, that the flexible line of credit have for the public sector. Um, sorry? Ample qualification. Yes, ample pre-qualification um, um, uh, for this line of credit to protect the stability of trade finance, which is the, tra the channel of transmission from the financial system to the real sector. And finally, um, we had to say the word on the, um, the recommendations of Basel, uh, the Basel Committee on liquidity. We're only focusing on liquidity. And is that, as, as you know, both Basel I and Basel II did not take into account the issue of liquidity at all, when liquidity was at the core of the problem in the crisis. And they have put in, uh, in place a number of recommendations for banks to have liquidity. But liquidity, the inst what is liquidity? They say uh, banks should have um, a high quality liquidity. But what is high quality liquidity? Well, it's cash, it's a number of instruments, but there's one particular instrument that we don't like, and it's that government paper is high quality liquidity according to the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. Okay. Now you go to Latin America, look at the bank's balance sheets, and Latin America looks fantastic. But in, a number, in terms of, how, of meeting the Basel recommendation on liquidity, especially they look fantastic in Brazil, Argentina, and Venezuela. However, as we have just discussed before, there is no way that we can say that government paper, since it's not issuing hard currency and does not have a currency of a, 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 an issue of uh, a length of large reserve in hard currency behind it, can be a safe, a truly safe asset. So our recommendation is that the Basel Committee define liquidity for bank purpose as composed of truly safe assets and that in many countries, government bonds definitely do not enter in this category. Okay, those are our recommendations, sharp, short, and hopefully thought-provoking. I'm going to ask my colleague <coughs> to uh, compliment, uh, say that I said something wrong or whatever, uh, briefly, so that we can start a discussion with you. You want to start, Guillermo? I mean, okay. just whoever wants to start. Thank you, <coughs> and good morning, everybody. Uh, no, just let me say a few things about liquidity, because it's one of those things that economists don't want to think much about it because we don't know how to model it. Uh, so we put it aside and uh, or call it M. Uh, but it turns out uh, our feeling is that uh, it's the main player at this at this point. Let me just um, uh, to to highlight that uh, this is a recent study by Barclays on the issue of shortage, or what they call shortage of safe uh, assets and a recent paper by the IMF, too, on that account. Now, if you uh, take a Barclay study at face value, they show that uh, safe assets collapsed in 2009 uh, by about 30% of uh, world GDP. It's an enormous collapse that when you couple that with the fact that uh, as we recommend here, that's uh, what many uh, emerging markets are doing, which is uh, uh, accumulating uh, international reserves. You have the supply of safe assets going down and the demand of safe assets by the public sector going up. So what's left, if you look at the uh, picture, which I, I highly recommend, uh, uh, is a tiny amount now in the private sector compared to 
what they had in uh, 2008. And the feeling is that uh, safe assets is a fundamental um, uh, instrument, if you wish, or component of the credit market. Because uh, it, we call it liquidity, but it could also be collateral. And the advantage of uh, safe assets is that it doesn't require a lot of information. We know what the treas U.S. Treasury bill is. We know that that, uh, with a very high probability, is going to be repaid in terms of dollars and so on. So there are certain assets that don't require information. When a guy goes to the bank and wants to, uh, to uh, get a loan and shows that he has or she has a substantial amount to save assets, then the bank is much more willing to be credit. Now, if you think of this in the global context that all of a sudden there is a collapse because of the GSC collapse, uh, papers collapse, and so on, uh, and, and also because, I mean, countries like, like uh, uh, Greece was AAA and now it's not anymore. So the, number, the, the amount of uh, safe assets has collapsed in the world. Because of that, I mean, the whole world, you can imagine, uh, has now a problem of lack of collateral, if you want to call it that way, or lack of liquidity. So that's the context uh, we, we think that we are living. And, uh, and uh, investors are, of course, going around looking for investment opportunities, but they are very uh, itchy, so to say, very sensitive to, to news. So our concern is that some of the capital that is coming to Latin America uh, could be more unstable. Sometimes we call it hard capital, more unstable because of that reason. So a little, uh, a little shock coming from the from the capital market that there is a, say, crisis in Europe, or there is a chance of a crisis in Europe, that by itself uh, may induce a, 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 a reflow of capital outside of the region. So that's why uh, having that in the background, uh, we, we decided that we should focus on, on the liquidity issues and different angles, and that's how international reserves come up as a uh, as an important issue. That's a debatable issue, certainly, are countries over-investing in, over-accumulating reserves or not, and so on. So that's an issue that it would be great to be able to discuss here. But that sort of uh, motivates uh, the thrust of this uh, statement. Thank you. Okay, you went. Make a very brief comments, and uh, as you know, uh, the final statement is always short, but our discussion is uh, is very long. So there are some issues that uh, do not end up necessarily in the in the final statement. Especially the five. But uh, so let me just make a, a couple of brief uh, comments. First of all, when we defined uh, that uh, fundamentals in the region are currently weak and we uh, uh, put the current account surpluses that have uh, uh, disappeared, okay? One may ask, why is that a weak uh, fundamental? <laughs> okay. Because one could say that uh, maybe there are components of uh, the commodity price boom that uh, generated, that induced the current account surpluses that may have become more permanent than transitory, so you would expect some uh, current account uh, a balance uh, deterioration. However, I think that the important thing is that uh, is that makes the country more vulnerable to uh, shifts in uh, capital flows. Okay, so in this sense, it's not that it's weak by itself, but it's weak in the sense that uh, in in uh, in re in relation to the worry that eventually the external scenario might uh, uh, change uh, significantly. Then <clears throat> we discussed uh, on the lender of last, last resort uh, two, uh, two additional things. First of all, it is undoubt, undoubtedly that uh, uh, from the experience in the crisis so far, uh, central banks have been very effective at uh, uh, stabilizing markets that have become dysfunctional. Okay? And in that, they have... Uh, you know, the, in the advanced economies, central banks have exceeded uh, significantly their conventional frameworks of intervention, okay? Uh, when we look at this in uh, crisis management in Latin America, this poses actually a very interesting uh, uh, question, 
because <clears throat> if you look at the uh, central bank charters and the legal uh, framework under which uh, banks operate, typically in the region, it's not at all easy for central banks to exceed their conventional frameworks. However, in all of the banking crisis experiences, central banks normally face the need to do something that is not exactly what is written in their charter. Maybe ex extending uh, rediscounts at longer maturity, accepting uh, uh, different collateral requirements. There are a number of things. So in a certain sense, at least my, uh, 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 I think that there is an issue to think as a structural reform or as a medium term reform in terms of uh, a, how to, uh, to give central banks the flexibility to be able to exceed their conventional frameworks at periods of uh, high stress or banking crisis. And we have to find a, a way to balance that flexibility with the possible loss of credibility because, uh, you know, maybe the big difference between the, the advanced, the major central banks in the world and the central banks in the region is that uh, still our experience is, uh, is much uh, more recent, okay? Finally, uh, another issue uh, that uh, uh, puts together the lender of last resort with uh, the issue, the recommendation of tackling uh, the toxic assets uh, head on is that uh, there is the view that uh, the, the central bank through the lender of last resorts have been effective at uh, solving problems that affected directly banks. But uh, was, uh, ha they have been quite ineffective at avoiding a credit crunch and uh, the real effects okay, from the crisis. So in a certain sense, uh, Guillermo always has this uh, sentence that uh, you know Wall Street was saved, but not uh, Main Street. Okay, so um, that is a that is a significant uh, issue of how to 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 uh, make uh, a central bank policy actually in a way to to eventually reach and uh, minimize the the real effects. Okay. I don't think we have uh, a necessarily an answer. Uh, we discussed uh, the role of uh, this uh, fall in safe assets as actually one of the uh, uh, factors that uh, uh, lead to to the real effects that and the and the decline in growth and and credit. But uh, well, this. Uh, uh, is certainly an aspect of uh, of central bank uh, policy that uh, needs to be thought uh, further. We can now um, open to uh, discussion, challenging questions. Um, you know, <sighs> Danny, uh, we'll, I think we're going to collect three or four questions, and then we because I see too many hands right now. Yes. Can you identify yourself every time, please, to ask questions? Um, I have a question for the committee. Uh, you want to increase uh, liquidity. Um, it's one way of uh, minimizing or lowering risk, but there are a lot of other ways uh, of risk management. The problem with increasing liquidity uh, is that you reduce credit and you lower growth, which makes a lot of your assets riskier. Uh, so I wonder, I mean, you never have enough liquidity to totally protect yourself. So I, I wonder, uh, what's the trade-off there between increasing liquidity and actually doing something which is uh, negative for growth, particularly since you also recommend that the central banks take the European central bank approach and only worry about inflation targeting and not about output gaps. So if you take the central bank out, they're not involved in promoting growth, and then you ask the private sector to hold excessive liquidity to lower risk. Is that really risk reducing is the question. Okay. Yes. Jim? <clears throat> Thanks. Introduce uh, yeah. yourself, please. Oh, Introduce Jim Hansen. Yourself. I'm a consultant at the World Bank and I teach at uh, Williams College Center of Economic Development. Um, I'd like to congratulate the committee first on pointing out the risks of government bonds. Um, the zero risk weight uh, 
has really been kind of a disaster, and it, the riskiness of this policy is still going on. Mr. Draghi's Christmas present was largely spent on buying uh, bonds from Spain, Italy, and Greece because they had high interest rates and zero risk weights. Second uh, question. The regulation didn't seem to say anything about the role of foreign banks now in Latin America. In the old days, we used to say, send the foreign banks, they'll take care of everything, we don't have to worry about supervising, and so on. But now we see that the troubles of Santander and BBVA are going to spill over in Latin America. Um, they've been asked to provision more in Europe, and that money is going to come out of their subsidiaries in Latin America, and sale of some of their subsidiaries, and in this point in the situation, this crisis, who's going to buy those banks? So I'm afraid that's going to lead to some sort of credit squeeze. So do we need a regulation about foreign subsidiaries in addition because of the risks that they may create for the system? Okay. Um, Eduardo, uh, just a second, please. Thank you. Uh, Eduardo Fernandez Arias, uh, Inter-American Development Bank. Just briefly, I, I also took note of the uh, elimination of the, the output gap from the central bank um, objective function as, as a recommendation like, like Danny. Uh, and I would like to, have, to hear more elaboration on that because that's an extreme position in the sense that it goes against the practice of some respectable central banks both in and outside the, the region. But in particular, uh, I, I noticed that uh, Pablo was talking about the central bank ability to affect Main Street. Well, I always understood that precisely to, to affect Main Street with credit and growth, that was the, the reason why uh, central banks had uh, an interest in the, in the output gap. And, uh, and he also cited um, uh, an expression by Guillermo. So I wonder whether it was a, a 3-2 division in the committee or how, how is that explained? Okay. Andy? And then we are ready. Hmm? Uh, yeah, Andy Powell also from the Inter-American Development Bank. I mean, I, I, first of all, congratulations. I think the, you know, the analysis looks really interesting and um, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in the discussions that, that you had. Um, it seems a bit more weighted on analysis and less on recommendations this time around. So I wanted to sort of press you a bit more on, on recommendations. I, I, and, and just going to the, the liquidity um, sort of hypothesis, I mean, I, mean I, I guess you could sort of make the argument that the, the lack of safe assets in the world could be potentially extremely positive for Latin America, right? That we have low world interest rates and presumably that lowers the risk premium, right? If um, you have a lack of uh, safe assets for those countries which are, at least are, are reasonably uh, high, high ratings in, in the region. Uh, and so we could be taking huge advantage of this and the current account deficits could be a sign of um, us uh, using this as a great opportunity to, um, for investment basically, right? Or one could also have the theory which seems to be sort of more implicit here that it's a danger and that the current account deficits are reflective of something else. And, and what I, have, of course, have in mind, which hasn't been mentioned yet, is a kind of Dutch disease. We have high commodity prices uh, as well. So presumably our commodity balances look pretty good, but our non-commodity balances must therefore look um, pretty bad. And, and perhaps we're not having an investment boom. Perhaps we're having more of a consumption boom. Um, and, and, and so I, I'm, I'm slightly surprised that context wasn't mentioned in, in your analysis. But then on the other hand, you know, we've done a lot, right? We, we've invested a lot in reserves, as has been mentioned, and, and different countries have been doing macro prudential policies. We haven't been calling it that, but we all call it now macro prudential policies for some time. So, so my question really is, you know, are we doing enough given this context, or, or, or what is it that we're not doing that, that we should be doing apart from accumulating reserves? Okay. Yeah, an advantage of being first is that if we don't answer all the questions, I was only the first one. I know. So I it's know. their blame. The problem in the moderator. Uh, <laughs> okay, very, very interesting questions, all, all of them. I mean, the issue of liquidity, I know. I mean, when you 
it, uh, it, it evokes, uh, uh, if you say there is lack of liquidity, it evokes the vision of the old Latin America where we pour liquidity everywhere. That's one thing. Uh, the one that Danny emphasized, I think, is the fact that if you lead the private sector to, to uh, care a lot about liquidity, then the investment will be lower and growth will be uh, sacrificed. Uh, I think the issue here that concerns us is mostly short run. We feel we are, we are thinking of this in terms of oh, kind of short term. Uh, in, a, in a context where uh, safe assets are, are scarce in the world and where monetary policy, what we call monetary policy, is that you expand or contract something that has no value in the world. So we have to be objective about it. Uh, so the one thing you can do with your money is to stabilize the domestic prices. Going beyond that is a little bit tricky if you don't have international reserves. I mean, the advantage of the U.S. is that it prints international reserves. Uh, but uh, uh, the <laughs> and maybe even the disadvantage <laughs> of the U.S. is that they print and therefore could care, could care less about certain fundamental issues that are going to go come back to haunt them eventually. But uh, but in Latin America, we feel that the, the the moment of truth is just a few steps away. For example, in the Lehman the Lehman episode is a very interesting one because it hit uh, Chile. You wouldn't expect that it would hit Chile so badly. Output in Chile fell by two percent. We computed uh, the contraction. We looked at the contraction of domestic credit in Chile, and the flow of credit went down by more than two standard deviations something that we call sudden stop of domestic credit. So you see why the, the, the connection between the, what happened in Lima to uh, the shock in, in Chile going through partly the financial uh, system in Chile, plus, of course, the, the fact that the exports contracted. But that also was, uh, you can link it to the Lima episode, because exports in the world went down because of a financial uh, problem. So it's, it's very financial, the whole thing. It's very external, the whole thing. And you have a country that we all agree is very well run from a per macro point of view, and however, it was badly hit. So that's that's a frame of, of our frame of mind, if you wish. So we think, well, what have we done? Uh, can we, uh, I guess you pointed out, uh, Andy, about uh, the, the fact that, yes, now there is an opportunity uh, one can think of this as an opportunity to invest because interest rates are low and so on and so forth. They are low, but they can go up very quickly. Uh, now, in the past, I mean, the study by Carmen Leiderman and myself in 1993 uh, showed that the domestic uh, flows of capital into Latin America were very sensitive to in short-term interest rates in the U.S., something that we couldn't quite explain at the time. But I think I now understand much better. Uh, because if you think of those flows as being basically liquidity flows, then they are very sensitive to short-term interest rates. So if we are in a game li like this, uh, what could happen now? No, nobody expects, we don't expect here, that interest rates, the, the federal funds rate is going to go up in, in the short run. No, uh, there is no sense of that. But what we notice now is that uh, even though the, uh, the uh, advanced countries, uh, central banks, do not uh, jack up the, the, the interest rate, interest rate that the uh, emerging market had to pay, I mean, the, the risk, the MB, can jump up very quickly because of problems in the center. I mean, the accident, in, in, in my mind in particular, uh, I think we all agree on that, the accident was a, a financial accident. And that can be repeated now in Lehman too. Uh, if that happens, then interest rate that the region is, is facing is going to jump up. That's our fear, our concern. So uh, certainly uh, you can think about the long term. We are concerned about the fact that when you have a, a shock of this nature, then output, uh, because of the impact on Main Street, uh, contracts and, and takes a, a while to recover. That's very costly. So yes, we want to think about the long term, but we are in the midst of a situation where 
uh, again, if you have to make a rank of issues, uh, the rank of issue of avoiding a uh, contraction of being less complacent at the present situation, which is in principle very favorable, capitalistic coming in, when you look at Latin America, it's a beauty relative to, uh, to Europe and everything. But is, is it a structural situation in the sense of being uh, reliable? I doubt it, because I've, we've seen Lehman 1. Uh, so it's, it's a matter of uh, where you put the, the emphasis here. Uh, I will leave. Uh, why don't I stop here so okay. everybody has a chance? Um, well, as Pablo mentioned, so the, there are several items that we have discussed a lot and we are not put, uh, we didn't put in the um, statement. But uh, regarding the, the topic of the relationship of credit and growth, obviously that there is a lot of previous discussion that we had in, in, in other statements and since CLAF uh, started to discuss these items. And uh, we permanently discuss about what is the first institutional or what is the best institutional arrangement that we may have uh, for the financial system. And obviously that we consider the role that banks may play in uh, channeling saving to investment. But uh, if you burden the banking system too much on that objective, then you jeopardize the other function of the banking system that is to assure the payment system. So we, when we talk about enhancing the liquidity in the financial system, it's because we are paying a lot of attention to uh, that part of the real sector that is related to transactions. And if you look at the third lesson that we are uh, mentioning here, we, we are thinking in the same process. So uh, pay attention to trade finance, because uh, we believe that this is one of the channels where a lot of damage is done in the real sector of the economy. So uh, uh, I think that uh, channeling saving to investment can also be done through the capital market or through other instruments that do not affect liquidity <coughs> in the same way that liquidity is being affected when you use the banking system to provide uh, credit for growth. Um, the other point that is very, very important is that uh, Jim Hanson mentioned that it is true that we are having uh, some worries in the sense that uh, those large international banks that are in, in Latin America that usually uh, we thought that they will help, help a lot uh, doing their operations in Argentina, now they may be a problem because they, they are uh, collecting resources to deliver those resources to the headquarters. And so uh, this is not the case of most of Latin America, but if you take the case of Argentina, uh, we presently are having capital outflows. It's not the case of Brazil or, or other countries, but but if you adapt to, let's say, the wrong policy making internally, the point that you have international banks that need some international resources that are going to be taken out from Latin America, then you are, in a way, uh, complicating the situation too much for what we are really worried about, that is the, the, the possibility of capital outflow starting in the future has a consequence of what is going on in the rest of the world. Thank you. Pablo? Let me <coughs> say, say quickly something about uh, all of the questions, <laughs> each of the questions. First about uh, <coughs> Danny's question. I think that uh, <coughs> what you um, uh, point out is uh, in a certain sense, a, a typical and well-founded uh, worry about uh, having too high liquidity requirements or reserve requirements in the sense that uh, the, the larger the requirement, the lower the ability of a bank to provide credit. In a certain sense, I think that the important thing here is not to think about credit in terms of just the volume, but uh, to think about in terms of what is sustainable over time. 
So in a certain sense, I think that uh, there is a trade-off between the volatility or the variability of credit and the level. So in a certain sense, what uh, the liquidity requirement does is to try to uh, produce a situation in which maybe you have lower credit than if you have a very low liquidity requirements, but then that, that you can sustain that credit over time, and therefore maybe for the real economy uh, ends up to be uh, better. Okay. Uh, on the point raised by Jim with respect to uh, foreign banks in Latin America, first of all, I think it's a very important point. Um, and in a previous statement, we, we had, uh, in fact, talked about the need to think about ring fencing uh, within Latin America. But it's true that that is not in the frame of mind of central banks right now. The origin uh, of uh, uh, this has to do precisely with uh, the Basel framework and the, uh, the consolidated supervision uh, principle, which, in a certain sense, uh, delegated the supervision of banks to the home countries uh, regulators and in the in the 1990s for instance where when uh, international banks were thought to be very safe uh, in fact was a complete delegation almost okay and uh, everybody was comfortable with that uh, and while we and when we uh, in fact in the case of argentina uh, we established a relationship with the U.S. regulatory authorities to be able to help them supervise the, uh, the activities of branches uh, of American banks in, uh, in Argentina. Okay? But of course, now the situation is different because the, potential, the, the banks that may have potential problems are precisely these international banks. And there is no mechanism for an interaction between supervisors in Latin America and supervisors in the advanced economies to actually understand the nature of these risks, okay? And I think that that is a, is, is, should be part of the agenda of a different world in which uh, we maybe in this are no longer such uh, underdeveloped vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the advanced uh, economies. The second aspect that has to do with uh, the risks, we have to distinguish between two types of risk. The risk in the asset side of what a bank invests in, say, you know, in complex assets, and simply the risk that, is, uh, that comes from the presence of the institution, which may be hit by uh, the liquidation or the bankruptcy in its own country and therefore uh, affects. In, in most of countries in Latin America, really the financial system is prevented from investing in foreign assets. So uh, uh, the, 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 the risk from the asset side is relatively small. But I think that there is an exception which is a big exception, which is Brazil. And maybe uh, Pedro can, can talk about that. Um, uh, so essentially ours is a more institutional uh, 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 risk. Um, with respect to the issue of including the output gap in the, in the uh, objective function <coughs> that Eduardo raised, our discussion really went along, uh, was a little bit theoretical or conceptual, okay, and, and went along the following lines. Uh, that <coughs> if, you, if you look at what uh, even Ben Bernanke and... Uh, and others wrote in a book on inflation targeting about how, how a, a monetary policy should, uh, should be run prior to the global financial crisis, the notion was that you, you didn't worry about uh, uh, the output gap. And essentially, the best was to focus on the inflation target, and that was the best way to ensure uh, the, 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 the output, uh, the best uh, but now we are suddenly including, uh, by the force of the event, the, uh, the, the output gap as a central uh, a concern of central banks. So the, the, our question is how, how do we, where is this leap from, this, uh, the, from the first position to the, to the second position, okay? And there is where the issue of discretionary policy arises. If you think that you have a very credible central bank that does not have problems of discretion, maybe the dual objectives 
can be reasonable. And therefore, it may be reasonable that the Federal Reserve thinks this way or, the, or other advanced central bank thinks this way. But does, that don't mean, this does not mean that when you go back to Latin America, we again copy what is done <laughs> elsewhere. Okay? And in our case, in Latin America, what we think is that the, uh, the problems of discretion and timing consistency are not so far away uh, so that uh, it, it, this shift in, uh, in uh, sort of central, poli uh, central bank policy objective may be dangerous. Okay? So it's a little bit of a note of caution, but it's not it's a, it's a general statement for, uh, for everybody. Um, Andy mentioned something that we discussed, and I think that uh, it's, it's good to, to give our impression. The issue of, you know, why do we talk about liquidity so much, okay? As Guillermo said, I think that uh, we're worried that the external environment might uh, deteriorate, okay? And the reason why we give so much importance of liquidity is because we think it's the only instrument that really helps at that moment. Okay? Now, it is the only thing that countries are doing or that countries should do. Well, there is an, an, an entire discussion about macroprudential policies, okay? And it's very fine, okay? But I think that our conclusion of discussing the issue of macroprudential policy is that uh, it is not clear that macroprudential policy avoids the crisis, okay? I, I think that this, today we can talk about associations. So sometimes we say, well, this country did well, look at the regulation, and then, you know, that regulation was good. But, you know, at the beginning of the crisis, we thought that uh, what Spain was doing in terms of regulation was the example for the world. Dynamic provisioning, uh, uh, pro uh, contracyclical uh, capital buffers, and look, now where is Spain? Has a banking crisis, okay? So... I think they are important, but we, I think there is n not evidence, enough evidence that uh, a, that a regulation alone a, can actually really prevent crisis. And maybe the only real defense that you have is uh, liquidity. Pedro, why don't you speak a little bit on, on Brazil and the concerns uh, that you have? Okay. So there's the advantage of being the last, I can be short. <laughs> Uh, I will comment two, two subjects. The first one is about uh, the, the, what we call the micro uh, governance of, of banks and the financial institutions. Uh, in fact, we j even discussed that, but uh, in order to have a, uh, a, a good size for the paper, we took out and we'll go in another meeting in the future maybe to discuss this. But basically, uh, if you study, let's say, the economic incentives for an organization like a bank, how people uh, react uh, um, about you know, incentives, we see this, that most central banks, they, don't, um, uh, they are not concerned about how the, in the big banks, how is the uh, architecture the, the organization architecture of the banks, how, who takes the decisions, how are you know, the, the islands of power inside the bank, and so on, so on. So there's a kind of a black box. How the, the banks and the large financial institutions, they act. Sometimes we are caught by surprise, like you know, JP Morgan, or, uh, and billions and billions of dollars. So we, had a, we have a concern uh, in a market uh, like Brazil, that that's since we are not really controlling the inflows of capital because there are, we try to do, but uh, we want to be able to control the outflows of capital too, and if the situation changes. So, so the the idea is to have, let's say, more um, uh, regard about how the 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 banks, how they are organized in terms of, uh, of compliance with the macro prudential regulations. So that's the basic point. Well, the second point that I wanted to, to comment uh, is that you know, Brazil, I think most of, of South American countries, we are in natural 
resource-based economies. And uh, where, you know, <coughs> from time to time we have this boom and buzz of uh, exports and imports. And right now I think the, the exchange rates in Brazil I think is the focal point. Uh, because in this boom that is lasting several years, um, what happened is that our uh, manufacturing sector was adapted to uh, an appreciated currency. And so if you look at the, each chain of value in, in the manufacturing sector of Brazil, more and more they were now outs outsourcing uh, uh, components and so on. Uh, so now if you, the exchange rate goes up, uh, depreciates again, uh, and if you don't have liquidity, like in the past, it can be a disaster. So I see um, the question about the, the, the costs and benefits of accumulating liquidity. Uh, in, in times like that, uh, it's difficult to calculate because you know, the, 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 the costs of a sudden, let's say, stop of, of, a, of a foreign exchange can be very disruptive in, in economies like the, the Brazilian economy. And uh, so basically we have no three risks of exchange rate. One is the translation risk. That's not a problem. Uh, the second one is the transaction risk. But one, what I'm concerned is about the operational risk because most uh, companies in Brazil are today have part of the inputs uh, uh, brought from abroad. So uh, in my opinion, this, that would be a major concern from right now that would be together with the, the inflation target. Um, okay, I want to um, make a very clear point. We care about growth. It's not, this is the, the, our statement and some of the question could give the impression that, well, yeah, you know, uh, this committee really doesn't care about growth. No, we care enormously about growth and precisely because we care about growth is that we think about the, uh, the kind of recommendation that we have put forward. One clarification, when we call for liquidity, we don't call for just having the banks full of liquidity, whatever that is. We've made the point over and over again in the statement that we want access to hard liquidity, hard currency liquidity. It's not having a lot of, of cash, it's not having a lot of form. It's, that's not what we mean. We, we mean, you know, it could be what you can have in terms of hard currency as well as to access to different sources of hard currency liquidity. So it's not flooding the bank with anything that any government can define as liquidity. That's a very, very important point, okay? Because otherwise, you know, you can get out with the wrong assets, that, the wrong impression that we just want to have large amount of liquidity, whatever that liquidity is. No. That would be very detrimental to the point that Danny uh, 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 raised. Um, the other issue very much related with that and that uh, um, Guillermo was talking about in the context of safe assets. Just think about this for a second. Imagine a world where you are kind of in a state state and you have a certain amount of output and corresponding to that output there is an amount of safe assets. Okay, this safe amount of safe assets um, corresponds or are compatible with this amount of economic output, world economic output. Now imagine that for some reason there is a mirage of safe assets growing beyond what is sustainable. That's what happened with the creation of all these toxic assets before the crisis. The perception of a much larger safe assets that actually was going to be sustainable. So if now you cut them off because they were never really safe assets, you have just a mirage of safe assets because they were very liquid, because they have AAA um, and you saw they were safe, but they were not. So corresponding to that is going to be a lower level of output corresponding to the actual and truly incredible amount of safe assets. So there is no way that we believe that there is going to be a sudden recovery of fast growth in the world. It can happen. 
it just cannot happen. The safe asset has decline on a permanent basis, and therefore we need to understand that the new equilibrium is at a lower rate of growth than we had before. Okay, I could say many more things, but then I don't. Uh, Uvida Dushu, the Carnegie Endowment. Um, I have one question and a, and a comment. Uh, safe assets declining, is that um, the kind of number of bonds that are safe that has declined, or is that the value of safe assets that has declined? The reason I'm asking is because obviously the value of government, U.S. government bonds or German government bonds or U.K. government bonds has exploded uh, as interest rates have fallen. So uh, I wanted some clarification there. The uh, uh, comment I have is that uh, I read your report as basically a call for caution, and I completely agree with it. Um, but I wanted uh, just to make two elaborations. One is I think it would be very useful to have a sense quantitatively of just how far out of line uh, you think uh, the world economy is relative to some sort of equilibrium. And uh, 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 for example, I mean, the main variables are uh, interest rates are very low relative to some kind of equilibrium. The international, whatever, safe asset interest rate is very low. Commodity prices are still high relative to some sort of long-term equilibrium. World trade actually is going quite rapidly, 4% for the IMF uh, uh, this year. Not not great, but okay. Not too far from an equilibrium, et cetera, et cetera. Some sense of how far we are from an equilibrium and how big uh, the shock could be uh, quantitatively, I think would be very useful. And finally, uh, related to that, um, so much emphasis in your work, understandably given the objective of your of your committee, is on the financial regulatory. But I ask about the real economy, and uh, really, what you, ideally you want is not just more liquidity. What you really want is an increase in the savings rate, in the national savings rates of uh, these countries to reflect. Uh, the very risky uh, situation we're all uh, going through. And so therefore, I wonder whether you shouldn't say more about, uh, you, know, uh, you know, what the structural budget deficit should be, uh, as distinct from the actual budget deficits of governments, you know, some kind of uh, rule like Chile has. Um, and, uh, and equally for the private sector, I mean the non-financial private sector, uh, some sense uh, derived from your quantification of how far we are from an equilibrium of what, what are sort of guidelines which corporations should keep in mind. I realize that sounds like central planning, but I think it would be very helpful in this case. Hi, uh, Michael Pedroni. I'm the director of the Western Hemisphere Office at the U.S. Treasury Department. Um, a couple of questions. I'm on this liquidity recommendations that you have. I must admit that I'm a little bit uh, puzzled by the recommendation. If I'm understanding you correctly, what you're saying is that uh, banks ought to accumulate more truly safe assets. That's what I think I hear. Uh, you saying and what I read here, but those assets need to be financed. And how do you fi how does a bank? So an asset exists on the on the you know asset side of the balance sheet. A bank needs to finance that. How is it going to finance that? Well, it either has to finance it through deposits or through borrowing in the interbank uh, money markets. The problem is that if you're holding truly safe assets, which uh, you know depends on how you define it, you're talking about banks potentially earning a negative spread, i.e., becoming unprofitable. These are private, most of these are private sector banks, and that's obviously not a, you know, that's, that's not the role of banks. The role of banks is to intermediate credit, not to borrow at rates that are higher and then invest in assets that are, are yielding a lower rate. So uh, maybe you could just help to, to clarify what, uh, what your intention is there. I mean, the flip side of that, or another way to think about that is uh, the central bank dilemma. When a central bank accumulates foreign exchange reserves, and it has to finance those by 
borrowing in its own markets, it, it takes a, a loss. But of course, these aren't central banks you're talking about. These are private banks. So how do we, how do we square that? Uh, and then the second thing is I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about uh, what you mean, uh, elaborate a little bit more about addressing toxic assets head on. Um, did you have in mind there more uh, ECB buying of, of um, Greek and Irish and Portuguese bonds? Did you have in mind uh, something uh, beyond what the U.S. has already done through, through TARP and some of its other programs? So maybe if you could just elaborate a little bit more on, on that issue as well. Good morning. I was wondering if I can elicit any comments on current money. Oh, Arturo Porsekansky with American University. Sorry. No. Um, I was just wondering if I can elicit any comments on current monetary policy trends, um, namely what's hot. Um, you know, we have a number of countries that have rock bottom unemployment rates. If they had an output gap, it's nowhere to be seen. Their current accounts are deteriorating, even on, a, uh, on an unadjusted basis for terms of trade. Um, they, they're clearly overheated. And yet, um, <clears throat> um, you know, are they, uh, should they be uh, loosening uh, policy like Brazil is, or tightening or staying steady like some of the Andean countries? Uh, is fiscal policy playing a supportive role? Uh, should they be intervening less in the foreign exchange markets? Um, be nice to have a comment on current monetary policy. Uh, thanks. Uh, Alan Gelb, Center for Global Development. Uh, my question is about asset bubbles. Uh, you haven't talked about that very much. And, you know, we know that many countries in Latin America have been sort of as you said, poised between having uh, low interest rates in the global economy and high commodity prices. And if that reverses, it could be quite serious for some countries. And very often we see that certain sectors like real estate sectors are particularly vulnerable to turndowns there. So my question is, are there particular asset bubbles that are of concern to you? And if so, do you see uh, any particular role for policy other than general lending caution and liquidity? Yep. Just thank you. Just a quick question. Rob Colarina, AIC Investment. On this topic of the toxic assets, um, yeah, could you share which countries might have to come together to get to get uh, the the, uh, say the, uh, the needle moving towards it? Uh, for this discussion of European TARP, you know, the discussion of, of Germany being the strength of that, I was curious in, in this region, what countries may have to come together which might be a little bit unusual or uh, unique partnerships? I think we have enough questions now. Um, do you want to start, Guillermo, again? Okay. Uh, briefly, uh, on uh, Udi Dadush's uh, question, uh, I, I, it's very hard to know how far from equilibrium we are. But uh, let me give you a sense uh, uh, of how I feel about the situation presently. I think we are at the verge of another Lehman crisis, Lehman-type crisis. Uh, with a big difference. Uh, the region is uh, less strong. Current account deficits uh, have increased, as we showed. Uh, the fiscal deficits have deteriorated. That's very clear. And also, when you look at the, at, at the advanced countries, I think the, the willingness, the predisposition of uh, the central banks to come forward as aggressively as they did before is not there. Uh, the fiscal in the U.S., it looks like, if anything, there's going to be a contraction. So leaving aside what we think about that, whether they should be more proactive or not, I think uh, the whole situation is, is much weaker. Uh, I suspect that uh, when push comes to shove, they will do something. But uh, that's not what you expect from a central bank. A central bank, if it's going to be effective, has to be ahead of the curve. So I suspect the, the, the fiscal and monetary authorities, because partly of political constraints, are behind the curve. So things are going to have to get much worse before they come forward. So that's why I think in that respect, we are further 
from equilibrium than we used to be in 2008. And, uh, and that's the motivation for being, and I think you agree, uh, very cautious, but I, I wouldn't be able to put a number <coughs> on that one. On, on the issue of increasing savings, I don't know what to say. I'm not a Keynesian. Let me make it very clear. In the in the textbook sense, I mean Keynes was much brighter than the textbooks, as we know. Uh, but uh, but I'm not a simple-minded Keynesian. But but still, uh, I mean increasing savings. The, the, if the issue is uh, lack of uh, of uh, safe assets, in order for savings to become investment, you need credit. If you don't have savings, if you don't have if you don't have safe assets, let's assume that safe assets are important. Uh, for intermediating savings into investment, you could have a Keynesian type situation in which savings increases and there is excess of savings and actually you have a collapse of output. So if we don't open up the credit channel, the risk of increasing savings presently could be of a Keynesian nature. And uh, that's why one of the points that we insist in the, in the paper is on uh, taking care of toxic assets because that's what's pre maybe preventing the uh, the transmission from savings to investment. That that's the idea. Uh, uh, now, uh, Michael, if I got your first name uh, right, uh, yeah, that, that's a very valid point. Actually, uh, we are just finishing a paper with Alejandro Izquierdo and uh, Rudy Lukung from uh, the IDB, precisely looking at those issues, cost and benefits of accumulating reserves. It's very tentative, very hard to get, I mean, uh, one number. Uh, but if anything, according to, to, to that paper, uh, uh, is that uh, the present conditions, since the current account deficit is a factor that uh, calls for optimal, higher optimal reserves, and given that the region, the current account has deteriorated, that translates into a higher optimal level of reserves in the region. When you compare where they are now, there <laughs> seems to be an excess, a, 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 a shortage of international liquidity, taking into account the cost of acquiring blah, 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 which is in the paper. Now, the, the other reason why international reserves, optimal international reserve may be higher now is that uh, interest rate, the opportunity cost of holding reserves uh, is, uh, is lower. I mean, in the sense that if you see what I mean. Yeah. Um, so, but uh, that, that, that's a very valid question. It's very hard to have a, a, a hard answer. But that, that's the way I would go uh, to assess uh, the optimal level of uh, uh, reserves. Um, let me see if I have uh, 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 on Alan Alan Gelb's uh, question on on bubbles. Uh, yeah, that's a concern. Uh, maybe we did not elaborate in the presentation here, but that's one of the first things that we mentioned in the statement. Our, our concern is is is, is that uh, actually this. Uh, uh, a capital inflow episode may give the false sense of liquidity. If a capital inflow episode, uh, the way I think about it, is like the opposite of a bank run. In a bank run, everybody is going to the bank to take the money out. In the opposite of the bank run, everybody goes to the bank and tries to put the money in. So when you see everybody trying to deposit in the bank and then you wonder, uh, is it good to deposit in that bank? You don't care so much about how safe the bank is because you know that there is a sucker behind you to whom you can sell your deposits before the thing blows up. So uh, this, uh, if you have lost, it's not, it's not even hurting. It's a bit, it sounds like hurting, but so it could be very rational because there is a cue that you feel more confident about it. So the, 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 the in that context, and this is a point that we make very briefly in the note, you could have uh, that the capital inflow episode gives rise to bubbles in the sense that the slight increase in interest rates may uh, burst the bubble. Uh, so, yes, we are very concerned about that. Thank you. Rob.
One of the idea in, in terms of bonds is high quality bonds, international reserve, and so on and so forth. But uh, the point is that uh, we think that uh, in addition to that, we would need more safe assets uh, generated for the private sector or in the private sector. And your question is right in the sense that how would you finance that? Uh, I, I think that uh, it is a necessary first step because uh, suppose that we have a private sector generating something that is truly uh, investment grade. That would allow a second generation of credit because those assets are going to be used as collateral for the machine keep going. Uh, so I, I, I don't think that that has to be artificially pushed by commercial bank. I think that the private sector must have the institutional stability, exchange rate stability, uh, all the elements that we can uh, say that uh, are necessary for uh, the creation of those assets and, and of course a legal framework and all that kind of stuff is really necessary for that first generation. But I don't think that we have to think in commercial banks uh, chasing for a safe asset. No, the, the safe assets have to be generated for genuine savings and, and fundamental projects in the private sector. That that's what was not done in the in the mortgage crisis. So that, that's that's what what really originated the problem. So we have to start back generating those class of assets, and that will help to to develop credit lines in the future. No? I want to add to what you've been saying because your question has been very popular. Um, for the private sector, remember our emphasis is on hard currency liquidity, right? So it's not necessarily borrowing more to have more liquidity, a point that I keep insisting. is the exchange of the liquidity in many cases that is not hard currency liquidity into hard currency liquidity. Now, that, of course, is going to have a cost associated with that. I mean, there is no question about that because, you know, uh, if you hold government bonds and go government bonds are, have uh, a high yield, then, of course, uh, you are going to have a cost. But it's not, again, you know, having to borrow to increase the amount of liquidity. It's more a question of asset management in, in, in a way to uh, recommodate, reallocate the, the kind of liquidity that you have in your bank's balance sheets. And that's why we complemented our recommendations with not only what you can have in the bank itself, but what you can access as future line or potential life of credit swaps with central banks from other countries, but that go directly to the private sector. Okay? Just to complement and, uh, that. Yeah, I will compliment too. <laughs> it's a really popular question, I'm telling you. <laughs> but let me first, uh, uh, there was the question on uh, on what uh, was associated with a collapse of uh, a safe assets, if it was a value or quantity. Uh, it was both. But essentially in the numbers that we have seen, the largest uh, a, a portion of safe, safe assets that disappeared is essentially it has to do with the what then now we're called the toxic assets, asset backed securities, and the government sponsor agencies. Okay, so those are, a, and of course you have uh, then the downgraded uh, uh, bonds uh, from some of the European countries. But in what we have seen, the largest portion had to do with the uh, government sponsor agencies and the asset backed uh, uh, securities. Uh, let me let me uh, continue on this on this issue because the point you you made about uh, uh, the fact that uh, liquidity requirements uh, may be may generate a cost to banks. Uh, in the case of the U.S., for instance, it would be true, okay. Uh, and typically, one would think that way, much uh, as uh, one would think uh, a reserve requirement, okay. But what's what's the main the main issue here? In the in the previous you know previously to the crisis, the Basel framework didn't talk about liquidity because it was assumed that uh, if there was a liquidity problem, uh, there was a central bank that would solve it. Okay. Uh, then 
when the crisis uh, uh, started, the resolution of this problem or this liquidity problem became very costly. So in a certain sense, what people realized is that uh, uh, the banking system or the financial system was a, a free rider on something that had a cost. Okay? So the idea of uh, imposing liquidity requirement is certainly to have uh, uh, private actors share in the cost of this insurance. Okay? And, uh, and, and in this sense, one shouldn't worry that it's costly for a bank that you ask uh, for liquidity. Uh, uh, uh. Now, it is interesting that, uh, this, that in the U.S., one would talk about an unprofitable o operation. But if you do go to, the, to Europe and the high-yield uh, countries, it may be actually profitable. And in fact, what is happening with uh, the LTROs uh, of the ACB is essentially that they promote a, f a form of carry, carry trade which may in fact be profitable for the bank. So this is, a, I think, an additional problem with the Basel recommendations because uh, now that you have bonds of uh, high yield and low yield, in fact, what Basel, the Basel framework is doing is generating an incentive of meeting those liquidity requirements with, high, with risky bonds. So it, it is even worse <laughs> that uh, actually not, uh, not having a liquidity requirements, okay? Um, our concern with uh, attacking the toxic assets uh, head-on has to do with the fact that uh, the, the solution, the typical solution of solving banking problems with low interest rates is a solution that uh, it may work if it, is, if it doesn't last uh, necessarily very long. But the, 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 the situation currently is one in which we start to see that really we have a long period of uh, interest rates with, which may generate all you know, other risks. So in, ter in practical terms, I think that yes, central banks should do more TARP. Okay, should purchase of toxic access, assets. If you ask me, I think that uh, I think that it would have been much more effective for the for the Fed instead of doing <coughs> quantitative easing to actually purchase directly more toxic assets. And then you have to address individual bank problems, okay? Because it's not simply that you purchase. But I think that uh, uh, in terms of uh, being more effective, I think that uh, central banks should probably engage uh, uh, more in, in that type of operation rather than in the traditional open market operation, which uh, may not be, really may have uh, a very little uh, effect. Um, okay, and uh, we can talk about for the mortgage program individually about the Feldstein proposal, which uh, I like very much. Well, thank you very much uh, for joining us one more time. Uh, we took note of your concerns, which may motivate our next statements. And um, well, thanks again, and um, um, till next time, which is going to be in the fall. <laughs>